Greetings, 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 and a very happy Sunday afternoon to each and every one of you. And hopefully, if you are one that acknowledges and celebrates New Year, then we wish you a very happy New Year and a positive uh, and productive one for 2022 and beyond. And we hope you are achieving your highest level of mental, physical, and spiritual health and any other kind of health that you can think of. We hope we wish upon you the highest levels of achievement in that area. And we thank you so much for joining us for our Ancestors Voices, the 92nd edition, the 92nd broadcast that Shakura and I have done. And today we're going to delve into the conflict between W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey. A hundred years later, people still talk about their very public spat. And we wanna just expound upon that and talk about specifically from the standpoint of who is it that actually instigated? What happened, first off, who instigated this public spat? And certainly who benefited from the public spat? And why it's important 100 years later? Like, what are the important lessons we can learn from the contributions of these giants of African history? So we thank you for joining us. And we start as we always do. We want to pay homage and respect to the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. And when we say that, we have to say this every time because there's, you know, confusion is the standard in the capitalist system. So we have to explain what we mean. And when we say indigenous people, we are talking about the people who identify as American Indian, as Chicano, Mexicano, Latino, even those that use the term Hispanic, they're still descendants and or are indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. If you're not from that uh, heritage, then you are not indigenous to the Western Hemisphere. And if you claim that you are, then we need to see the evidence of that. You know, we don't believe it. We believe. Yeah, sure, there were people that came here before colonialism, but all these people claiming it today, that's just not scientifically possible. So we know that we don't know our African history. We have believed the master's lies about Africa, which means we believe the master's lies about ourselves. So because we don't know who we are, we feel the need to make up a history and claim something that never happened that we can't even prove. And because in the capitalist society, truth and justice is completely divorced from material reality, we don't even need to prove it. Nobody even, the bar is so low, we don't even have to prove anything like that. We can just say whatever the hell we wanna say, and it's all right to say it because in a capitalist society, one plus one equals 29. Well, that's your truth. Then you stand strong on your truth. Hell no, you don't know what you're talking about. You need to do some research and figure out what the truth is. So we're talking about the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. We respect them and their struggle to get their land back because this land belongs to them. And of course, we honor our African ancestors who are absolutely the only reason why we're here today. So whenever you see somebody either say or wearing something that has that ridiculous slogan, I am not my ancestors. Well, who the hell are you if you're not your ancestors? Your ancestors, whatever resistance you claim that you have, that's where you got it from, was your ancestors who fought from the Indian Ocean in East Africa all the way out to the Pacific Ocean on the Western shores of the Western Hemisphere and all the way in between for 500 years, they fought, fought and fought for our dignity. And they are the reason that we are here today. So we give nothing but respect for them. And, 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 and we challenge those who say and wear disrespectful messages like that, who are you then? Like you just created resistance? And if you created resistance and did, you didn't get it from being a, a part of a legacy of resistance, then why have you not been able to do more than you've done? You know, all, all you've done wear is, is wear a shirt that says, I'm not my ancestor. You have no organization. You have no uh, work in progress to advance human civilization. So again, like, you know, stop it with this nonsense. That's the resolution for 2022. Stop the nonsense, stop the ignorance, stop the nonsense. Let's all be accountable to each other. So we thank you all for joining us for this very important program that deals specifically with um, what are the roots of this conflict between these historical giants, Du Bois and Garvey. 
And how was that? What were? The, how was the conflict developed? Who was? Who was really behind it? And how did they engineer it? And how did they benefit from it? So that's what we're going to get into today. And we want to thank you again for joining us. And we start with just our brief introductions. Our Ancestors Voices is sponsored by the All African Peoples Revolutionary Party. And the AAPRP is a revolutionary, independent, mass, pan-African political party based in Africa. And when we say pan-African, what we mean is our objective is pan-Africanism. And the definition of pan-Africanism is the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. Today, there are 55 countries in Africa. And if you count the islands around there, there are about 58, 59 territories in Africa today. And all of those 58, 59 territories were created through colonialism. None of those territories were created by us. And none of those territories were created to benefit us. All of us who live in Europe, in, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, North America, Central America, South America and the Caribbean, none of us are here by our own doing. We're here because of colonialism. So we don't acknowledge that because none of that was done in our interest. So we say that until Africa is free, Africa is our mother. And there's no way we are going to be prosperous and be able to build independence as long as our mother is calling out for our help. And so until Africa is free, we believe and we are convinced that no African anywhere on earth will be free. All 2 billion of us all over the world will continue to exist in the current state that we live in. So that's our objective when we say Pan-Africanism, one unified socialist Africa, which, which we see as the solution to our problems wherever we reside on the planet earth. And the book you see on the right, the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, written by the founder of the APRP, Kwame Nkrumah, outlines our strategy to achieve Pan-Africanism. And it's not just a theoretical strategy, it's work that we are engaged in on the ground in Africa to build a worldwide Pan-African fighting force that can seize power from the multinational capitalist corporations who dominate in Africa and use government institutions to create policy to enforce their will. We have to seize power. We have to take it, you all. And that's what we're organizing to do. And you see the logos there are Pan-African formations throughout the African continent. And there are many more that we work with that are in agreement with the objective of one unified socialist Africa and us uniting into one entity is what Nkrumah called for in that handbook. And that's the work that the APRP is engaged in. And Our Ancestors' Voices is, of course, hosted each week by Ajamu, myself, and Shakura, my biological and ideological daughter. And we are active organizers within the All African People's Revolutionary Party. So we thank you for joining us for this very critical topic. And to get us started on it, I will turn it over to Shukura. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that, Daddy. Thank you. Um, greetings, everyone. Of course, I echo everything my dad said, but I also just want to just express our, our appreciation that you were here. And then also, I just want to not only back what my dad said about, you know, we are our ancestors, but I also just want to take this moment to thank our ancestors for all that they did to help set us up so that we could be in a position to organize nowadays in, in the 21st century in 2022 and so on. And I mean that to say, I'm not sure where you all are located throughout the world as you listen to this broadcast. I'm not sure what time of day it is for you, but here in Memphis, Tennessee, it is 29 degrees, 29 degrees right now. And I just can't help but think that because my ancestors sacrificed and did everything that they could so that I could be sitting on my couch in a heated environment, even though it is 29 degrees outside. And we know that shelterless people around the world have increased in terms of them not having shelter. I just think that this work that we're doing is so important. I wanna remind each and every one of us 
to show gratitude and to give thanks to our ancestors, because just like my ancestors struggled so that I could have a better life and I could be sitting here, hopefully continuing to organize because it doesn't stop with me and it shouldn't, I shouldn't think that the struggle would stop with me. I should keep going. I would encourage each of you to continue with that as well. We all have a responsibility to make this world a better place. And as far as I'm concerned, the, the reason that there are shelterless people in the world, that's part of my responsibility to address that. Because I personally would not feel comfortable knowing that somebody is outside in drastic conditions such as that, knowing that it's way too cold for even a person to be outside. So, so why, why do we live in a society where that is happening, okay? So I'm just asking us to just humble ourselves. And you know, if, if you thought that our narrative was gonna change for the new year, then sorry. It is still the same. We're still encouraging you to join an organization working for justice. That's gonna always be the narrative because the more that we organize, the more that we start to do work and we start to have experiences where we learn how our work can truly, truly, truly make a difference and impact all of humanity so that one day no one will have to be shelterless outside in 29 degree weather because we will be able to control our resources and decide how our resources are spent. So that if people can't afford to live in a place where they can pay rent or a mortgage on a monthly basis, then we have shelters in place where people can have access to warmth without us charging them as a dollar. Because from a humane standpoint, everybody deserves to have a situation where they don't have to die of freezing to death, right? So just asking you to be humble on a new level. And if you didn't join an organization last year, let's not waste any more time because time is of the essence. And we really, really, really need you to join soon because your decision to join is truly going to help determine the outcomes of not just us right now, but future generations as well. It really does start with you and not to individualize it because it's all about all of us, not just one person, but you have a responsibility as a person to contribute so that your choices can impact all of us. That is how it's all connected. There is no I, it is only us, that's it. So we have to continue to remember that and just give thanks for everything our ancestors have done because without them, I'm not so sure I wouldn't be sitting here in this warm climate right now. And I'm very grateful for that. So just giving you all a little food for thought as we start to talk about Du Bois and Marcus Garvey. So first and foremost, I am just so grateful to talk about both of these individuals because I, of course, have been impacted by their choices that they made. And I just want to give a shout out to Du Bois. I'm such a um, like political education activist, but also I just really love learning new things. I'm not afraid to learn new things. I'm not afraid to do research. I'm not afraid to sit down and read books. And so when I went to a public health conference a couple of years ago, there was a whole session that was dedicated all to Du Bois because evidently I learned that he in the public health world is known as a social epidemiologist, which means not only does he study how social diseases can impact people, so patriarchy, racism, things like that, but he studies how social developments contribute to health disparities. And so he did a study and they talked all about it at this session in 19, excuse me, in 1897, where he was given a Philadelphia city and he was asked to assess it and then to see if the built environment, the built structures, the sidewalks, the streetlights, all these social determinants of health, he wanted to study how they contributed as a sociologist to the outcome of people having poor health disparities. And I was just blown away by that study. So of course the first bullet is, is truly remarkable in us understanding how he has contributed not just to our Pan-African and revolutionary understanding but how he has always advocated that Africans deserve to be healthy because of the fact that we are oppressed that contributes to why we are so sick. And of course, because my thing is health and I study health and that's what I know, I'm of course gravitating towards that because I think that's really dope for lack of a better term that he was able to do that and be a Pan-Africanist because it's not like one is more important than the other. They're all contributing factors to us getting access to our land back, control of our resources, which of course would address our health issues as well. The second note I wanna highlight is that I am really excited to think about how Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Kwame Nkrumah and many others were all impacted just like Du Bois because Du Bois developed his Pan-African lens 
throughout his experience, throughout his experience and political education. And because he had that ability to have those experiences and enhance his political education, that's why I draw the comparison to Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Kwame and Krumah and many others, because they all had those experiences. Again, the only reason I know this is because I've been reading about these comrades in my work study circle, but all of them had these experiences because they started traveling to different parts of the world. And every single one of them, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, and Krumah, they all said, and I quote, you know, I thought that Africans were just oppressed in my neck of the woods. I was very surprised to come to Jamaica, or I was very surprised to come to Canada, or I was very surprised to come to Pennsylvania or Memphis and learn that Africans are just as oppressed in the Congo and in Nigeria as they are in Miami and in a part of Costa Rica. You know, and so it's just really interesting to think about that because, of course, these experiences. So first traveling. Right. And then second, doing the research, reading about other comrades who have walked these planks and been able to do these things. I remember from the parallel uh, Garvey and Garveyism, the parallel that Marcus Garvey actually wanted to connect with Booker T. Washington at one point. And he was really interested in the work Booker T. was doing in Tuskegee. And unfortunately, I think Booker T. passed before Garvey had a chance to get to Alabama. But the point I'm making to you is, this is how we study and understand what other comrades have done, because we need to enhance our political education, not only so we can know what our ancestors have done already and take note of that and learn from them, but more importantly, so we can join forces. Because if they're already figuring out how to create gardens where they can feed thousands of Africans who are suffering from food insecurity, then why wouldn't we join forces with that? Especially if that's an example of us having a community defense where we can control how our resources, i.e. our tomatoes and our cucumbers and our basil, how all of those things are being disseminated to our communities so that we don't have to starve every day and we don't have to have our children starving, right? So I just thought that was really cool. And then the last point I'll make, is it's because Du Bois understood that and enhanced his political education that led to him understanding the importance of being in an organization that was working for justice, which brings me to my last point. So because he started the Niagara Movement and the NAACP, not just him, of course, there were others who contributed to those foundational starts, but because he contributed to starting these organizations, it was foundational and him helping people to understand how important it is to be in something that is larger than yourself and is greater than one individual. And I just wanna give you a fun fact. Both of my parents, my dad when he came to visit and my mom when she came to visit, we all went to the Ida B. Wells Museum in Holly Springs, Mississippi. And so fun fact about Ida B. Wells, she was also a co-founder of the NAACP. And she was actually a person who worked not just with Du Bois, but also with Marcus Garvey. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, but just helping you to connect to see all the dots, family. That's what I'm trying to do. Next slide, please. So we know that from Garvey and Garveyism, this beautiful, beautiful book that Amy Jocks did an incredible job of writing, by the way. Jocks was able to teach us that Garvey like Nkrumah, traveled throughout Jamaica and other parts of the world. And of course, as I just alluded to with Du Bois and with Malcolm X and other examples, Garvey also noted a common denominator with Africans. And it's, it's just, that's where the Pan-Africanism comes into place, you all, because from a capitalist imperialist standpoint, I know you're tired of hearing us say this, but capitalism and imperialism want to feed you the same piece of meat every single day. And what I mean metaphorically is, they want to teach you that you are only experiencing something based on your experiences, which means you have to close your mind and you shouldn't think about anyone else and anyone else's experiences. You should just think about your own because only you can experience this in the way that you're experiencing it. Now, I'm not talking about um, you know, manic depression because of an abuse situation. Like that's a very unique situation. What I'm talking about is feeling exploited and oppressed. Like, I don't think one person can only know how to experience that. I think groups of colonized people have a very good analysis of what that feels like because they've been experiencing it for hundreds of years. And for some of us, like our Irish family, they've been experiencing it for thousands of years. So my point is, 
we need to understand that that's how we resist capitalism and imperialism by throwing out the individualized perception and by adopting a collective ideology that not only are my experiences unique to me and to others like me, but I should join forces with them joining an organization so that we can figure out how to make all of these experiences that make us feel like we are material possessions. We should figure out a way to eradicate all of that. No one should have to feel like they are property. No one should have to feel like they are devalued. No one should have to feel like they don't matter. No one should have to feel like that. Not non-male people shouldn't feel like that. LGBTQ people shouldn't feel like that. Anyone who has had their land stolen should not feel like that because the land is owed to them. That's their land. They deserve to have it back. And however you identify from your sexual preference, however you identify because of the melanin in your skin, none of those things give justice for you to be treated unfairly or to be dehumanized. So joining an organization will help you understand how to collectively join forces so that you can resist those oppressions and resist the idea of the system continuing to oppress you. And Garvey understood that. That's why Garvey started the UNIA because Garvey traveled all around the world and saw that Africans were treated like crap everywhere. And he literally thought to himself, I just, I, I thought at least that in the US they would have a little bit of a leg up or I thought they would have a leg up in Canada. I remember reading uh, Amy record him saying that. And so he was shocked beyond measure to understand that we don't matter everywhere. <laughs> We don't matter in the Congo. We don't matter in Kingston. We don't matter in Miami. We do not matter in Berlin. We don't matter anywhere. And so Garvey started the UNIA to help the rest of us understand not only is this a problem, but there's potentially a solution to address this problem. And so that moves into our next bullet where the UNIA was connecting the struggles that Africans faced everywhere. And this of course is what Pan-Africanism means. That's the definition of that. Where you have a pan lens of understanding, not only is this an issue everywhere, but this is why socialism in Africa will help address all these issues everywhere. The continent itself is not respected. So why would the descendants of the continent be respected any more than the continent itself? It, make, it makes perfect sense, which is why we need to take back our continent. That's why. Because we are not being respected anywhere. And if we decide how our resources are being spent, people are going to have to respect us. They're not going to have a choice because they're going to have to answer to us. And we get to decide how that works from a collective communal situation and perspective. Garvey used the UNIA and its resources to help people understand not only were the conditions for Africans the same globally, as I said, Kingston, Congo, British Columbia, Berlin, to answer your, to give an example, but there were, there was also a solution to the problem and all Africans had to do was organize and join the UNIA's call to action. The third bullet, and I'm wrapping up here, is that it was brilliant for Garvey to not only make the publication available in numerous languages, but to have it available in 33 different countries. I mean, that was st strategic beyond measure in terms of access, because regardless of where Africans were and regardless of colonialism, they could ascertain and comprehend what was going on in their own cities and with their comrades across the world. The Negro world was a united informative voice for the people in a time when communication resources were scarce. So remember, you know, based on privilege, that's why resources were scarce and access, but not just that, but remember this is a time when letters were the most viable mode of transportation for updating folks on situations. That was the main way that people exchanged information and communicated. And again, the museum in Holly Springs, Mississippi, the Ida B. Well Barnett Museum, Marcus Garvey invited Ida B. Wells Barnett to come and speak at a UNIA event. And my dad and I just went to the museum when we were together a few weeks ago. And both of us took note of that because they have it highlighted in the museum. Neither one of us knew that. And I thought to myself, okay, so even Ida B. Wells was starting to develop her Pan-African lens, which was really cool to understand and learn about. And even as an organizer, she was incorporating that. The last thing I'll say, and I'll wrap it up and pass it back, is that, you know, my dad might already be planning to touch on this, but I just wanna also just highlight why it's so important to enhance your political education and saying that when I read Garvey and Garveyism, I remember reading how Du Bois would publish things critiquing and highlighting Garvey's delay and getting his ships and all the resources paid for to begin the voyages and taking Africans back home. Towards the end of the Garvey and Garveyism book, 
Du Bois began to understand and publish pieces in support of Garvey. And Du Bois claimed that going home was one of the many solutions to reduce African oppression and actually praised Garvey for being told to suggest that Africans should return home. But it was Garvey who brought such a quote unquote outrageous idea to Africans in the first place. And interesting enough how he was critiqued uh, gave, was given death threats. His family was given death threats. He had his, his business was, um, uh, they took all his resources and threw him in jail and he stripped all his resources. But his methods and his ideas would still later be honored even a hundred years later. And so that just goes to show you how it really isn't just about one person, but it's about his idea that he wanted to impact a mass group of people in a large way because he knew that if we could get back home, that would change the conditions for us everywhere from a global standpoint. Please make it a goal to join an organization and give yourself a timeline. You wanna honor Dr. King, join an organization by his birthday. If you wanna honor Malcolm X, join an organization by the day he was assassinated next month, but do something and give a date and a timeline to it and just try, step out on faith and go to a meeting. And if you don't like that meeting, then cross that one off the list and try a different organization. But we really, really, really can't have anyone straddling the fence any longer because our people are being murdered left and right. And we need you. We are calling you out right now. Please step up and don't let us down. Alutua continua. Y'all be safe out there. Thank you, Shakur. And I just want to definitely uh, pile on to that last statement because every day I have people telling me like it's it's very important for people to to tell people this for some reason I don't know but they're constantly telling me they want to make sure I understand if they don't agree with me. and I always tell people when they say that to me like I really could care less that you don't agree because number one you don't have any idea what my work is you you haven't studied it you haven't participated in it so you don't even understand what we're doing. So why would I care about your opinion? You know, your opinion doesn't mean anything. And number two, we have never once said that you had to do what we are doing. We've always said what Shakur just said, join some organization. So why are you telling me you don't agree with me? I wanna see you involved in whatever you do agree with. And since you're not involved in anything, that means you really don't agree with anything except capitalism because that's the only thing you're participating in is capitalism. So that's a very strong point. And it certainly, you know, feeds into Du Bois and Garvey because both of them were in organizations. Like Shakur said, Du Bois was one of the founders along with Anna Julia Cooper and Ida B. Wells Barnett and others in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. And I don't care what you say about the NAACP, you can call them Uncle Tom's or whatever you want, but all of us walk around here today um, exercising some of the conditions that the NAACP fought in the courts for us to get. So I don't, it doesn't matter what you say about them. Obviously, I don't agree with 5% of what they represent, but I still have enough sense to respect their contributions that they've made since 1909. And when that was no longer sufficient, when he was driven out of that organization, Du Bois ended up doing what Garvey was never able to do, go home to Africa and live in Ghana and become an advisor to Kwame Nkrumah when Nkrumah was president in Ghana and was able to play that significant role. And in between time, you know, flirting with various memberships in communist parties, always a part of organization. And of course, Garvey's participation in the Universal Negro Improvement Association was the reason why he was dri driven to jail and eventually deported to Europe where he died, you know, basically alone and poor. So we've had a lot of feedback from people this week about this event. And, you know, we've been doing this work for a while. So we have developed certain skills. And so most of the feedback has been people trying to make criticisms against both Garvey and Du Bois, different criticisms. Garvey was a huckster. He was a con man. This is what people say. Du Bois was a Uncle Tom, he was a sellout. This is what people say. And these are always coming from people who are not involved in any organization. And so, you know, Shakura, we got people 
trying to get in here with phone numbers and I've asked them to identify themselves and they won't do it. So they'll just be wasting their time for the rest of the, this hour. Um, so this is the, uh, the problem that we have to recognize is that you know, people in who are serious about changing the backward nature of this society are always gonna be involved with working with other people to push forward in that vein. And so for us, and I'll certainly speak for myself, for me, if you're not doing that, if you're not involved with other people and working, I don't take you seriously. Like, I don't believe anything you say about what you want to see happen because you're not doing anything to make it happen. That's the least amount you have to do. So that's a, we can't make that point enough. You're like, that's a, that's a consistent point because every, as, as Garvey said himself, you're gonna, we're only gonna live, the, the earth is millions of years old and you're only gonna live 70, 80 years. So just as an individual, you, we, none of us are equipped to understand everything we need to understand about how to change the forces of, of earth. And the only way we can do that is to unite with others. So if we're in an organization and it has even dozens of members, now the 70, 80 years are magnified 20, 30 times. So now we have hundreds of years of experience, thousands of years, depending upon how big we get. Now we have the capacity to sit down collectively and come to solutions. So this is just something to remember because we're talking here about who contributed to our people, right? And they wanna make it a competition and I'll talk about who I mean by they, but you know, when we talk about Du Bois's contribution to the Pan-African Congresses, right? It's staggering, right? Du Bois was a central organizer along with Anna Julia Cooper, I mentioned was one of the founders in NAACP and Henry Sylvester Williams, who was a lawyer from Trinidad. And the three of them, along with other people that helped them, created the first Pan-African conference, conference in 1900. And then from there, they organized uh, four subsequent Pan-African Congress meetings. Now, what's the difference between a Congress and a conference. Well, the difference is a conference, if you've all been to conferences, you know, you go there, there are topics discussed, you leave there, you may have contact again with the people you participated with, but most often you don't have any additional contact with them. You don't continue to build anything with the people who participated in that conference with you. It's, it's really a process to share information. And there's nothing wrong with that, that's great. But that's what a conference is. Now, Congress is different in the sense that the objective of a Congress is to come up with a, is, is come up with goals that you continue to work on in the time between the Congress meetings. And then you use the Congress meetings to come back and assess the progress of the goals you made at previous Congresses. So between you know 1900, and the early 1940s, there were four of these Pan-African Congresses held. None of them were held in Africa. They were held um, primarily in Europe. One of them was held in New York City. But they did continue to keep the fervor of uniting around Pan-Africanism alive. And that's almost those years from 1900 to the early 40s, those Congress meetings were almost single-handedly organized by W.E.B. Du Bois, no question about that. So he deserves definitely respect and credit for that. In terms of Marcus Garvey, as Shakur mentioned, his creation uh, with first sister Amy Ashwood Garvey, because the women are always written out of history, so we always have to include that. And then Amy Jock Garvey, his two wives that he you know, married one after the other, um, divorcing Amy Ashwood and then marrying Amy Jock, uh, they were essential in creating the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, and they had the objective of centering Africa around the liberation of African people everywhere on earth. As Shakur said, Garvey gained that consciousness that there is a there is certainly, as he put it, there's something happening here because everywhere you look, our people are at the bottom of the society. So that means either something is wrong with us or something is happening to us. And Garvey had the consciousness to recognize it was certainly that something was happening to us. And by us coming together on a collective worldwide basis, that was the key to us being able to solve the problems 
that we face as a people. And so he created an initial foundation to do that. He created the black star as an emphasis. And even today, if you look at the flags in the countries in Africa, a number of them, I think it's 20 something of them have some version of Marcus Garvey's black star in their flag as their national identity. And he created obviously the, the shipping, the black star shipping line. And the reason why they called it black star shipping line is because there was a company called the White Star Shipping Line of which the Titanic was its main ship. And that was a segregated. That's why y'all watch that, that movie. You don't see any of us in the movie because we were not allowed on the Titanic. So that's why Garvey's organization called their shipping line the Black Star Line to come back the White Star Line that was in operation during that time. And their focus was on utilizing the educational and material resources that we have gained in the Western world as a result of colonialism and taking those skills back to build up Africa. That was Garvey's whole purpose. And that was a fundamental contribution to the Pan-African movement because he brought the mass character to the movement. The UNIA was a mass organization that involved Africans of all stripes, all class statuses all throughout the world. Whereas Du Bois's work in the first four Congresses gave some intellectual direction, but it was primarily academians who participated in those initial Pan-African Congresses up until the early 1940s. But we would argue that the fifth Pan-African Congress held in Manchester, England in 1945, changed the character of those Pan-African Congresses and created a condition where the majority of people who participated in that Congress were active in the African liberation struggle on the African continent. And Kwame Nkrumah was the chair of that fifth Pan-African Congress. And he recognized the necessity of uniting all of these contributions that came before the fifth Pan-African Congress in 1945. And so that's why he had W.E.B. Du Bois as the honorary chairperson of the fifth Pan-African Congress. And that's also why he had Amy Jock Garvey, the widow of Marcus Garvey as the other chairperson to squash this concept that's still active today that Garvey and Du Bois were against each other and you have to take sides, you have to choose one or the other. You can't be for both of them as if that benefits us to choose one or the other. So that was Nkrumah's genius uh, approach to try to circumvent that backward thinking and to make it clear that the fifth Pan-African Congress, which made the Pan-African movement mass in character, was a manifestation of both the, the work of W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Mosiah Garvey. And that was extremely consistent. Now, we have to talk about this conflict because as you all know, you know, we always, you hear it all the time, even a hundred years later. Well, uh, Du Bois talked about Garvey's being black, black skin, and, and, and talked about, we love to talk about that kind of stuff, but we don't ever talk about why that happened, where it came from, who was instigating that. And first, let's make it clear that both men insulted each other. It wasn't one-sided. Certainly, Gar, uh, Du Bois was extremely reactionary in his colorism against Garvey, but Garvey reversed it as you know y'all know what we do you know uh we're we're infected by capitalism and white supremacy so light-skinned africans have historically talked about there's something less valuable about africans who are darker skin and in in result as as a response to that darker skinned africans have always talked about high yellow africans and talked about how africans who are light-skinned are trying to be white and so that's how Garvey attacked Du Bois. And that's how Du Bois attacked Garvey. But we don't ever talk about what were the instigating factors in this. They, the, the point being that neither one of them just started doing that on their own against each other, that you have to understand the political conditions of a hundred years ago. And we can start that analysis by talking about a vicious beast by the name of J. Edgar Hoover who you've heard that name because they taught you in school that he was this great uh, federal police officer and director for the Federal Bureau of Investigation for 54 years. And he was certainly the director of that vicious terrorist organization 
but he got his start with the newly formed Department of Justice in 1917 as a young man in his early 20s. And his first assignment was to go after both the Universal Negro Improvement Association and the, uh, 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 the work of W.B. Du Bois. That was his first initial assignment. And so how he had to do that was the way the FBI has historically done that. They sent letters to each person, making it look as if they came from the other person. So they'd send some correspondence to Garvey, making it look like it came from Du Bois, they, or, or Garvey's organization, looked like it came from Du Bois and his people. They'd send the same thing to Du Bois, looking like it came from Garvey and his people. And so they instigated the antagonism between them. And we know this happened because it wasn't just Du Bois against Garvey. During this time, you had other very principled and legitimate contributors to our Pan-African work. People like George Padmore, the great Pan-African theorist from Trinidad, uh, CLR James, another great Pan-African theorist and activist from Trinidad. And both of those men received this correspondence and they actually acting upon that went out when Garvey was speaking and heckled him when he was speaking. So this was a concerted effort to turn our people against the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. And certainly Du Bois was not spared of this sabotage because the FBI went after him relentlessly. And by the 1930s, they engaged in a process of stealing his passport from him so he could not travel and making him persona non grata here in the US because of his work um, against our oppression. And to the point where by the 1950s, by 1959, Du Bois, was able to do something Garvey was never able to do, go home to Africa and to, as I mentioned, become a, an advisor to Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. And if you go to Ghana, to this day, W.E.B. Du Bois is buried there. They have a wonderful mausoleum that I've been to three or four times where Shirley Graham Du Bois, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's wife is in turn next to him there. And you can go visit it there in downtown central Accra, Ghana. So he got more respect there. You don't have anything like that in this country. So he received more respect at home in Africa than he ever received here. And that's because Du Bois was persona non grata in this country. And the sabotage against Garvey, like all week since we've been promoting this event, we have to deal with these ignoramuses coming and ask, well, Garvey was a thief. He stole... I mean, you're, when you say that, you're accepting the version of history provided to you by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. That's their narrative. That's how they arrested Garvey. They said that the UNIA, Garvey, specifically engaged in mail fraud. There is absolutely no evidence. You cannot produce any evidence that Garvey himself engaged in mail fraud. Certainly, there were people in the UNIA who did that, and the FBI knew that those people had no connection to Marcus Mosiah Garvey, but they used that as an opportunity to go after Garvey. And that's how they were able to arrest and convict him and deport him from the country, which they knew would cripple the effectiveness of the UNIA. Now, the criticism that we will express with due respect to Garvey and the UNIA is they did not prioritize political education. So a lot of people in the UNIA saw the mass influence that they had as an opportunity to make money. And so these, these fools began to solicit money through the mail, which is illegal. You can't do that. You still can't do that. And so, you know, unless it's for some kind of cause that's verifiable. So that's, that's the fault of the UNIA. They were not able to effectively establish uh, a consistent political education program so that a lot of people who came to them were coming there for reasons other than advancing the African liberation struggle. But it's important to note that the sabotage against Du Bois and Garvey and the instigation of this conflict, the constant republishing of the insults, the encouragement of the insults, that came from your FBI. 
I say yours because it certainly ain't mine. That came, y'all, y'all that claim you're Americans, that's your organization. So that came from them. And it was their intent to sabotage any work that was being done to try to liberate our people. And this is what I've been trying to explain to these idiots that have been commenting all week about FBI research that they have on Du Bois and or Garvey and haven't read a single word like Shakur mentioned, Du Bois wrote numerous books, numerous books. And Garvey is chronicled in numerous books and haven't read one page from any of those uh, literary sources and instead rely on information provided to us by people who don't have our interests at heart. And as long as we continue to take that kind of backward approach, we'll never make any progress. And so we talked about, you know, the ruthless hounding on behalf of the U.S. government resulting in actually both men being uh, forced to leave this country is essentially what happened. And the disagreements between these two were, it's important to state again, expanded and exacerbated by imperialism. They were not individual conflicts that arose just from the individual elements of each person. And I know that that's how a lot of us see it because we only know how to see the world through an individualist lens. We don't understand all the forces that are at work that shape us as human beings. So we think, we actually think that what we believe, we decided to believe that on our own. A lot of us actually believe that, that we, everything we believe, we decided to believe it on our own. And we're here to tell you that almost nothing you believe, you decided to believe on your own. Practically everything you believe has been provided to you by imperialism. And this is without question true, unless you are engaged in a political education process that's independent of this backward system. Because if you are, then now you have a process to combat the ideas being projected at you 24 seven, 365 days a year by the capitalist imperialist system. But if you're not involved in that process, then you're gonna be influenced by these ideas, whether you mean to be or not, whether you know you are or not, it is a process that is gonna shape who you are as a human being. And I always give the example, it is approaching 40 years since I've eaten red meat. And I can still tell you to all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. And the only way that I can know that so well is because McDonald's, like every capitalist corporation, is relentless in their propaganda. And that's subtly in my mind because it's relentlessly projected to me. And if I sit down with you for five minutes, I can show you any number of ideas and concepts that are relentlessly projected into your mind by the capitalist imperialist network that you don't even know there. You think you thought of it yourself. And that's exactly what they want you to think, that you thought of it yourself. So this is important to understand that this is what happens because it helps us understand how these conflicts happen in our movement. And if we understand that, then we can take the steps to ensure that we don't react to the enemy's influence and propaganda against us that we're thinking, does this serve our interests? It's like Chris Tucker said in the Rush Hour movement, you want to understand where the problem originates, follow the white man with the money. And if that that is a, a, a humorous line from a funny movie, but it is as true as anything else we could say in this hour. If you want to understand what's happening in this world, that's what you have to do. And I remember when I spent time with Sister Elaine Brown, she said to me, you know, all you have to do if you want to understand what's happening in this country is look at who's making money. And that's the, a, a different way of saying the same thing. And it's 100% correct. And so when we ask who benefited from the conflict between Garvey and Du Bois, certainly the capitalist system benefited from that because what they were able to do is derail the struggle that Du Bois was engaged in, the work that he was engaged in. They were able to, fortunately, you know, if you go to Ghana, they have preserved his writings, his memoirs, his documents, the work that he was engaged in. But it's important to understand that what they have in Ghana that you can go there and see is only part 
of the work that Du Bois did. He wrote volumes that were seized by the FBI and this federal government. And why would they do that? Because they don't want you to read it. They don't want you to have access to it because he was writing about ways that we could get free. And if you study, you know, I don't care what you think you know about Du Bois, his analysis in books like Black Reconstruction, it's on parallel in terms, or, or the world in Africa. It's on parallel in terms of the volume of information that he has in there. And so, you know, it's very, I, I sit here with people who, uh, uh, you know, ha, can't, can't hardly uh, piece a, a subject and a verb together accurately trying to criticize Du Bois and his writing. I mean, that's just, it, it's just insanity. And the same type of people want to criticize Garvey. This man got millions of people, of our people together. And you can't even get three people, you can't even cook a meal and get three people to come to your house to eat the damn food. And you want to criticize somebody who's got millions of our people to move in the same direction. And you expect us to sit there, well, that's your opinion, that's your truth. No, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And shut up until you do the work to learn how to understand what actually happened. And stop letting your enemies get in your head and shape your brain structure so that you can, all you know how to do is, is pair it out and vomit out what they told you. So that's who benefited from the conflict between Du Bois and Garvey is our enemies, the international capitalist and imperialist network. When they sabotaged Garvey, they forced him out of the country. They sabotaged all his relationships in Europe and England where he was or Britain or whatever you want to call that backward country. And he was forced to die in poverty and in depression. And that's exactly what J. Edgar Hoover and his FBI planned for. Because in those days, that was before the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA didn't come along until 1948. So back in those days, the FBI engaged in national and international terrorism to protect capitalism and imperialism. And so again, this role of individualism, you all, you know, in promoting this disunity between Du Bois and Garvey, we have to understand that individualism is, it's really, I would argue, one of the very primary weapons of the capitalist system, because as long as we continue to see things through an individualist perspective, then we will never understand accurately what's going on in the world. We won't even properly understand what's happening in our lives because the forces at work here don't operate on an individual level. They operate on a collective. It doesn't matter what you think, that's irrelevant. They operate on a collect collective level. The laws of nature operate on a collective level. You don't have the ability as an individual to define gravity differently than anyone else. You don't have an ability as an individual to hold your breath and, and, and underwater and for an hour and never suffocate. You don't, you can't, you're subject to the international galaxy laws of nature and those are applied on a collective level. You wanna talk about science? That's what that is. So you don't, you can't create your own reality. But the capitalist system keeps trying to convince you that you can. And so we constantly walk around here thinking that our the way we want to walk through the world is a, a separate way from everyone else. And nobody here is walking through the world any different than anyone else. We're all doing the same basic things. We're eating the same foods, listening to the same music, um, reading the same garbage propaganda from the capitalist system having the same values, going to church or mosque or synagogue and hearing the same garbage every time we go in there, we're all doing that. And all of it is designed to keep us confused and keep us from understanding that our salvation is in coming together and developing an independent understanding of how to craft our future that's not confined and shaped by this backward system that depends on our ignorance to maintain its control and our oppression. So the correct legacies of Du Bois and Garvey, we would argue, is that Du Bois's model from 1900 forward, as we mentioned, created a lot of the framework for the Pan-African work that we're doing today. There is absolutely no question about that. And serious students of the Pan-African struggle know this. Now, I'm not talking about these idiots that, that that read some FBI inspired article and think they know everything. I'm talking about people who are participating 
in our movement know this without a question. And Garvey's militancy and his ability to make Pan-Africanism a mass concept 100 years ago has absolutely influenced in a positive way our struggle today. Garvey had a tremendous impact on every independence movement in Africa, no question about that. Kwame Nkrumah, uh, uh, Julius Nyeri, Sekou Toure, they have all, Patrice Lumumba, Amilcar Cabral have all talked about the influence of Marcus Garvey on their thinking. And not only that, we know that Elijah Muhammad, the longtime leader of the Nation of Islam was a member of the UNIA. We know that Malcolm X's parents, both of his parents, Earl Little and Louise Little. Louise Little was a Caribbean born African. They were both heavily influenced by the UNIA. And the trash analysis that you got from Spook Lee's ridiculous movie in 1992, Malcolm X with Denzel Washington, and haven't read a single thing about Malcolm, haven't even read his own words. There are like nine books of Malcolm's speeches and most of us haven't read a single speech out of any of those books. Don't even know what Malcolm said. But if we did that work, we would know that the, the narrative that he didn't know anything till he read the dictionary, that's some Alex Haley produced nonsense to sell books. That's not what happened. This man grew up under the influence of the UNIA. He always had an African nationalist perspective. But of course, political education is something that has to be constant, right? And that wasn't the case in Malcolm's life. He had so many socioeconomic challenges that didn't make that possible. So you can look at Malcolm, you can look at Tupac Shakur, born to a Black Panther, Afini Shakur, but also influenced by the reactionary elements of African street life, not engaged in consistent political education. So if you don't have consistent political education, capitalism will win out every time. And that's what happened in the early part of Malcolm's life. And that's what happened with Tupac Shakur. And that's what's happening with a lot of you because you're not engaged in a consistent political education process. So we thank Garvey because his influence was essential in pushing us forward in that regard and definitely benefits us today. No question about that. And we still have so much to learn about how to engage in principled ideological struggle so that we don't fall down that rabbit hole that Du Bois was suckered into against Garvey and that Garvey was suckered into against Du Bois, that Huey P. Newton was suckered into against Milana Karenga, that Milana Karenga was suckered into against Huey P. Newton. That always happens in our struggle for liberation. The enemy doesn't sleep. They're constantly gonna try to turn us against each other because they know that's their best strategy to weaken our movements. They can't, they can't weaken our movements without our cooperation. Without our cooperation, they're defenseless. So that's why they do that. That's why they did it in the American Indian Movement. That's why I sit here and look at the portrait of uh, the wonderful Aname Pikta Akwash, and they were able to convince people in the American Indian Movement that she was a police agent. She was one of the hardest and most dedicated workers in AIM, but they were able to convince her own people that she was an agent and it was her own people that killed her because the, the, this government always uses surrogates to do that. They were able to manipulate the Nation of Islam members into believing that Malcolm X had to be eliminated. They always rely on us and, and you, we're so happy to cooperate with them because we don't engage in serious struggle to organize our people. So that's what we have to do, you all. And so the larger mind see the value of both Du Bois and Garvey. And we see, we, we see that we cannot do the enemy's work for them. We have to highlight the great contributions of both of them. Of course they weren't perfect, but neither are you. So I, I don't know why that's even a discussion item. Somebody that ain't did nothing is criticizing the imperfections of people who did a whole lot, just didn't do everything perfectly. I don't, I don't that math doesn't add up. Without question, W.B. Du Bois, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, Amy Ashwood Garvey, Amy Jack Garvey made tremendous contributions. I would not be the human being I am today without all of those people I just named. And that goes for millions of Africans all over the world and other non-Africans who are inspired by our work. So we honor 
praise and love both of them. And we ask and encourage you to stop this nonsense. Stop being a fool for the capitalist system, promoting their talking points, and won't spend five minutes promoting the talking points of liberation for our people and for humanity. So let's try that for 2022 and beyond. And so we want to ask you, thank you for joining us for today. And we want to ask you to join us next week, Sunday, January 9th. We're going to talk about here on our Ancestry Voices, college education and class suicide. Does your college degree belong to you only? Does your college degree belong to you only? You earned it, but who does it really belong to? That's what we're going to talk about. So we invite you to join us next week for that topic. And we invite you to go to the APRP Forward Ever shop and buy, support independent, revolutionary African organizations because we are not getting grants from the government. We get no tax write-off from the capitalist US government, from the capitalist British government, from the capitalist Ghanaian government, Tanzanian government, Azanian South African government. They don't give us no tax write-offs. The only way we can get any resources is if you support independent revolutionary African organizations. So please do. Please go to aprp-intl.org, sign up, join the All African People's Revolutionary Party. That is a good decision, you all. Go to a betterworld.me. That's my site. You can look at all these videos housed there. There's all kind of other stuff happening there as well. Check it out. Hoodcommunist.org is a wonderful site. You should go there, check out all the wonderful writings, participate in our Telegram program and all the other radio and all the efforts we're making to bring real information to you, y'all. You've got to support. We need everybody to be, so you should see yourself as a promotion artist for African liberationary liberation organizations and any liberation organization from any people that's fighting for justice. You should be doing that. And all these broadcasts below the Pontula on Monday, Revolutionary African Women, Forward Ever, the APRP New Mexico broadcast on Thursdays at noon Mountain Time. Support these and let people know that they're happening. Stop telling people uh, to tune in to MSNBC and CIA and CNN. I mean, that ain't, that's doing nothing to advance your cerebral capacity. It's not designed to do that. It's designed to keep you loyal to the people oppressing you. So support real information. You can't tell me that you listen and watch these broadcasts and you listen and watch the broadcasts coming through your television through imperialism and you don't come out of it thinking much in a much more healthy fashion from what we're producing than you do what garbage they're giving. You can't tell us that. There's no way that's true. And finally, Continue to buy a book, my book, A Guide for Organizing Defense Against White Supremacist, Patriarchal, and Fascist Violence. We appreciate each and every one of you. Support and participate, all of these things. They're very worthwhile, very important. Join an organization. If you don't want to join the APRP, join Black Alliance for Peace, join Cooperation Jackson, join Malcolm X Grass Moose Movement. You don't want to join any of those. Start the I'm Glad that the hour is up so he can stop talking organization. But you gotta be a part of some organization working for justice and do that and enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening. We appreciate each and every one of you. One unified socialist Africa, forward ever, backwards never, always stay clever in any endeavor and capitalism, y'all already know, it has got to go. Have a great rest of your evening.